Today we're going to be speaking about the three waves of African leadership. So the first part of the presentation is to give the context of where we find ourselves in Africa. And that's why talking about the three waves of African leadership, this was inspired by His Excellency Geinkop, who then was speaking about you have three types of leaders and three waves within which this leadership uh, occurs. And so when it starts, uh, then I said, hang on, I can actually put the leadership context of Africa and his institutions into the framework of the Lion King. So when you remember what the Lion King has, it has Simba, Mufasa, you've all seen the Lion King, I would imagine. So now seeing the Lion King, you have Simba, Rafiki, Scar, and so forth. And that you can tell the story of different African countries using the story of the Lion King. I'm going to use South Africa as a base because it's what we lived through. And uh, whereby you have the three waves that shows the Mufasa era, which is the founding father era. And then you have the Scar era, which is the revolutionary dictatorship era. And then until you have the Simba era, which is the modern Democrats. So when the Lion King opens, what you're finding is that the Lion King opens and Simba is being introduced to Pride Lands at the Pride Rock. So that's the Pride Rock and the Pride Lands is where it's the whole area that Mufasa controls. And then all the animals come and pay their homage to Simba because there's a passing of the baton from Mufasa to Simba. And uh, the animals want to see this beautiful experience. So when the Lion King comes up, all the animals are trekking to see this ceremony. And it's a big ceremony because uh, it's a momentous occasion. And ironically, 1994 was the year South Africa got its independence. And so the Lion King was also released in 1994. And it became the most selling, uh, the best selling animation of all time before Frozen <laughs> took it out of that <laughs> spot. And so when Frozen came, Simba but became the second uh, grossing movie, animation movie. And now, not everybody is happy that Simba is uh, coming to, it's being born. And uh, Scar is uh, out of the loop now because he was going to be king after Mufasa, and now he's no longer going to be king. So this is a similar situation that happens. So what does it represent for South Africa, for example? So you have the Mufasa era. These are people that are founding fathers, the Julius Nyerere's, the Sam Nuyomas, the Mandela generation, the Tambo generation, that said, we fought for political freedom and won. And they are now passing the baton to the Simbas, which are the young African lions. And sometimes in South Africa, we call them the clever blacks. The clever blacks are the young professionals, the young entrepreneurs that are going to be the next generation of leaders. So the first generation brought us political freedom and this new generation is now supposed to bring us economic freedom. So that's the credentials that they have. And the credentials that the founding fathers had are rightfully called struggle credentials. What are the credentials that the Simbas are going to have? Those should be economic growth credentials and also they should be called uh, climate change credentials because without climate change we are screwed and so then in 1994 all the frontier states that helped South Africa to win its freedom then came to see the momentous occasion where Mandela was inaugurated in May to, uh, 1994 and they were coming to see how they supported this moment and not everybody was actually happy because uh, they realized that Mandela loved young people in terms of pushed more young people. Now, when you find the history between the Simbas and the hyenas, now the Simbas 
are the nerds. When they grow up, they follow the rules. They are, you know, respectful of their parents. They are always doing the right thing. They go to school, you know, and like Vuyo Jack is a nerd. So Vuyo Jack would go on Saturdays to libraries, first go for piano lessons at nine o'clock in town from Soweto, and then go to, after the piano lessons, he would then go to the library for three hours to read a lot of books and take out, there was a quota that you could take out three books, but Vuyo would always take out six books because he would read them within two weeks, he'll be finished with the books, and then he'll go for another cycle. So that's why in his library, he's got a thousand books, and on his Kindle, um, more than 2,000 books. So it, that's kind of a nerd that we're talking about. After the library, Vuya would go and go to the movies, watch movies like he would know all the latest movies that are there, and go back home. When he goes back home, he's going to encounter the hyenas. The hyenas, these are the guys that sit in the township that do nothing, that find things that are going to do the easy way. We call them sometimes sotsies, mm. but there's a now better name. They are tenderpreneurs or they tend to be getting into politics in order to be able to make money, not really because of ideological issues, because politics is the quickest way to make money. And so you have this constant tension between Simba and the hyenas, and uh, you see it everywhere, whether it's in Namibia, in Katatura, uh, whether it's in uh, Durban, in Zimbabwe. I mean, it's worse in Zimbabwe because a lot of young people were really educated. And so, and the hyenas were far and few in between. Uh, and so that's a constant struggle between the hyenas and uh, the young African lions, the Simbas. Now, Scar says, no, this is not gonna, it's not going my way. So we need to be prepared. And therefore he comes to a plot where he kills Mufasa to say, we need to kill Simba and Mufasa, and then he plots with the hyenas. And in South Africa, we had our SCA moment, uh, whereby SCA uh, was able to, with the biggest union, with the uh, Communist Party and the Youth League, to be able to say, listen, we can uh, be able to take over the ruling party. And therefore they schemed, there was called a tsunami that was gonna come. And the tsunami came uh, in 2007 by the takeover took place. The buffaloes were sent to destroy Mufasa or his type of people. And the person that represented Mufasa then was Mbeki. And effectively, that was the coup. And when the coup takes place, what happens is that Mufasa, I mean, Scar, uh, and the hyenas take over Pride Rock and it becomes a securocrat kind of state where they cut all the critical parts of the states that are going to threaten them uh, and they also identify what they're going to eat. Big companies, ESCOMs, the Transnet, Prazas, and then the NPAs make sure that it's toothless, dismantle the hawks so that they don't do the invest scorpions, uh, that they don't do investigations. So effectively take over and control. And that's a reality of Pride Rock, whereby Mufasa ideals are out of the window. And it's about who eats, it's about who leads, it's about personality cults. And that's what Scar likes. Every attention is on him, is not really on building Pride Rock. What happens to Simba? Then Simba gets exiled into the world of Pumba and Timon. <clears throat> when Simba gets exiled to the world of Pumba and Timon, he says, I'm so hungry, I feel I could eat a zebra because he comes from that regal, uh, kingly kind of background. And Timon and Pumba says to him, dude, we don't like people that are gonna be eating uh, zebras because they grow and they're gonna eat us so you gotta be a vegetarian <laughs> you gotta eat grub you gotta eat those insects you gotta eat the uh, things that are creeping on the ground 
effectively Simba has to dim his light in order to fit into the world of Pumbaa and Timon. And he doesn't even reveal who he is. And that's where the clever blacks are. The world that they got exiled to is the white corporate world, the world whereby Pumba represents growth potential or growth imperative to say, you need to grow at whatever cost. There's no regard to transformation. There's no regard to the environment. Whatever you have to do, you have to grow at all costs. So that's a greed element that Pumba, and it's a Watok, is a pig. <laughs> so therefore, it represents that greed. And then you have then Timon. Timon represents that element in the white corporate world that says a strategic, a strategist uh, element that says, what is the minimum that we got to do to score the maximum points? when it comes to transformation. What is the minimum thing that we show that we comply with, without really complying with it, but we show that we actually comply yeah. with that so that we don't get caught? Yeah. So they don't really do the real thing. They work with appearances. They're strategic at working with appearances. So for example, they would go and spend $2 million. I know, $2,000 to paint a school. You said you don't paint, but. <laughs> so they would take $2,000 to go paint a school. But they will spend 20 million buying ads to say how wonderful we are, look at what we do, and they pay for the Glossy magazine on TV and their financial year end, they showcase uh, the pictures on saying this is our social uh, responsibility program. That's the Timon kind of mentality. That's how they are strategic. They're saying, how do you manage appearances rather than actually looking at the substance? And that's a world that... So they're all about appearance. They're all about appearance. So Simba has to fit in in this world. Mm -hmm. And that's the world that the clever blacks fit in because they know that you know, they can't really have much of a say. Mm -hmm. And without having a say, because they can't go back to Pride Rock, what is the reality that they face is that they will never rule the world of Pumba and Timon. They will never be able to dictate what terms and conditions are going to be playing itself out in this world. They have to take whatever is given to them in order to be able to survive. That's a negative side. But the positive side about it is that, uh, you know, you hear that song, Akuna Matada. Life is problem free. Akuna Matada. So, that's what they learn, What's, that's what he learns. Because under Mufasa, he was always strict. He was having to follow the protocol. He was always having to make sure that he doesn't go where the light stops. He can't go into the shadows. And under here, he's free to do whatever, but he's just not gonna be king. He's not gonna be able to rule Pride Rock from the world of Pumba and Timon. And at least he is able to understand the fun side of life. That's an upside. And then over years, what happens? Scar is not really interested in Pride Rock. You know, when you look at scavengers, scavengers eat what other people have left. Yeah. They eat dead stuff because they're lazy. They can't really deliver value. And that's what hyenas do. They don't create any value in Pride Rock. And what happens is that they just eat what the lionesses have left. And so they can never really build Pride Rock. And the hyenas that you find in Africa, they never can build anything. Mm -hmm. So as a result, what happens when the hyenas take over? Pride Rock experiences famine and drought under Scar rule. And this is where in South Africa, we've looked at under the rule in 2008, we had a lot of reserves, a lot of uh, kind of buffers. But over the years, what has happened? So we experience high corruption. We experience low growth rates. We have increased unemployment. We have ratings, downgrades. We've had real droughts that have been prolonged, especially in the KZN, Eastern Cape areas. We have low financial reserves. 
In 2008, we had a budget surplus. Right now, our budget deficit is much higher, and as a percentage of GDP, the debt as a percentage of GDP is growing above the 50% level. And actually, you have higher inequality. The rich have become richer, and the poor, and that is the reality of a scar rule. A scar can never build anything. Scar cannot create value, and they capture and destroy value. And as a result, some of the linuses then, they refuse to hunt for scar, so they start drawing the line. And when they are drawing the line, and these are the inner circle of, of scar, that uh, Pride Rock is not growing, so the hyenas are angry at them to saying, we are hungry, there's nothing left to eat. And we are hungry, so we need to be able to find uh, something to be able to give us sustenance. And the Linus said, well, the animals are gone. There's no water. There's no food for them. So why would they stay? So there can't be any food for these hyenas because there's nothing that keeps the animals here. Mm -hmm. And in South Africa, we've had Prasa, we've had ESCOM going under. We have SAA going under. We had SARS ne nearly being attacked. We have so many other state-owned entities. One trillion worth of budget for infrastructure between 2009 and 2014. Can you see the effect of that infrastructure? No. Because all that was eaten was eaten. And there's nothing left to eat anymore. And that's a reality. And what happens when the hyenas complain to Ska? Then... So Ska attacks the lioness who refused to follow his orders and then he removes them from his cabinet. So you had the Godans, the Nenes and the different ministers going out because they stood up. And when there's nothing left to eat, what can they do? Then Ska then says, out you go. And once he's out, they're still not going to be able to build anything. So what happens to Simba? So Simba misses home when he's in exile. So he's chilling with Pumba and Timon, and they say, looking up at the stars. As they look up at the stars, Simba says, wow, you know, up there, these are our ancestors, the people that look after us, whose blood causes through our veins. And whenever anything bad happens, they come and protect us, these ancestors. Pumba and Timon laugh at him and says, dude, that's, <laughs> that's bull. There's no such thing as ancestors. Those are just orbs of light. And there's no such thing as ancestors. And it hits Simba that these guys don't actually understand me. And they will never, ever get me. And he doesn't fit in. And that's what the clever blacks experience. Nobody understands the clever blacks in these white corporate firms. Because these clever blacks, they cannot be able to uh, express who they truly are. They cannot fully express their talent because they're saying, no, 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 this doesn't work. You can't dress this way. You can't come up with this kind of thinking. This is how we do things here. This is how you need to fit in. And effectively, they wear shoes that don't fit. And therefore, they can never be able to run because the shoes in the white corporate world are too small for their potential. That is why they're never able to run the race. And when they run the race, they'll never win because they're always going to be focused on the shoes that are too small for them. And they never are given the shoes that fit. And therefore, that is the problem that Simba realized, that I cannot be able to rule this world. But then Nala comes to the rescue. Every Simba needs an Nala. Now, Nala is a very practical, realistic, action oriented partner for Simba. Nala is the one who is able to say to Simba, let's do this. Simba is a dreamer. He, bring, he, he dreams all these big ideas and he can conceptualize big things. But a Simba on his own, without an Nala, just becomes all talk. And then Nala, without a Simba, 
become somebody who's efficient, but they're never going to achieve much yeah. because they never build a legacy. They're not following a big dream or a vision. So you can be as efficient as you want. You need to be able to have a bigger <laughs> dream. <laughs> yeah. So you need to then have a combination of a Simba and Nala. So I'm a Simba of economic transformation. I go and talk in platforms. I go and appear on TV. I talk to the newspapers. And I, however, I need to have Nala back home, our CEO and my co-founder. They are the Nalas who make sure that we collect the money, we employ the people, we pay the bills, and we are able to make sure that systems are run. Because a Simba can't be a Nala. And if you think that you can be able to do it, forget it. There's no big company that was done by a Simba alone. Except Elon Musk. Elon Musk. So let's look at it. Bill Gates. He needed to have a Steve Allen. The Google guys needed to bring uh, Eric Schmidt. Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook says, I can do this. Uh, no, no, you can't. You need a Sheryl Sandberg. So every Simba needs an Allah. There's no way you're going to be able to do it yourself. And that's what's going to be critical for success in any corporation, even in government, even in any at home <laughs> you know yeah so so therefore the, that combination is what builds a solid foundation to any kind of structure then simba is convinced by nala to say okay we gotta go back but simba is still reluctant because simba needs to engage with themselves and therefore rafiki comes into the picture and rafiki says and rafiki is the wise man who then says, you know what? He knocks some sense into Simba, and he says to Simba, you need to find the Mufasa in yourself because you can't be like Mufasa. Mufasa did his part. Mufasa fought for your political freedom. Now you need to do your part. You need to build on the foundation that he has laid by building that economic freedom for your people and build your pride rock on that credential of economic freedom. And it's only on that basis that you can actually be able to then say, I am a Simba. But by, by doing that, you need to find the Mufasa in yourself. But you've got to be more than a Mufasa. And um, Rafiki in South Africa is a Bishop Dudu. Because Bishop Dudu is the one who knocks sense into people. He speaks the truth to power and he's able to lay it out and he's got integrity and he doesn't care what people think because he just follows what is thinking, what he says and what he does are aligned. And so therefore he is able to knock sense into uh, Simba. And then Simba, finally it dawns on him, yes, Mufasa lives in you. That means that the, he becomes lit in what he thinks, what he says, and what he does. It's integrity. When what you think and what you say and what you do are aligned consistently. And once Simba finds that out, he then has to consider how is he going to go back to Pride Rock? then he needs to mastermind his way back. Firstly, if he goes back and uses brawn to fight Scar, what's going to happen? Scar and the hyenas physically are going to overpower him. He cannot do it by himself. Two, if he goes and mentally outmaneuvers Scar, Scar is an old, old dobby. Simba is a lighty. Scar is experienced. He's got, he's an old crook, he's an old chess player. He's able to navigate his way through any situation. So he will never, nobody can beat Scar mentally because Scar is mentally superior. That's why he's a mastermind. He's an architect of note, a mastermind of note. He's got superior intelligence. He might not have schooling, but he has superior intelligence. Then, the only way that 
Simba can win against Scar is spiritually. How? So if we took all the lights out in this room and then you lit a candle in the corner, that little candle, no matter how dark this room was, how many years this room was dark for, that little candle is able to dispel the darkness away. And when it dispels that darkness, what happens? More light comes. And the more candles that you light in the room, you're able to dispel completely the darkness until there's no darkness. Because what is darkness? It's just an absence of light. There's no power in the darkness. However, that's the same thing with corruption. Can you fight corruption directly? No. Because you, if you fight corruption in this room, is very dark, and you're going to hit against many things. And people are going to kill you that are corrupt. They'll take you out because you're going to be stopping them from eating. So if you go and fight corruption directly, you're going to lose. You're going to lose your, either you lose your livelihood, or you lose your reputation, or you lose your life, or you lose the people close by because they'll try to use the people to get you to keep quiet. So what becomes important is that Simba must not allow anybody to interfere with his light. And Simba must then light other people's candles for him to rule Pride Rock because that's when the light will come and darkness cannot be able to come into Pride Rock. That is why Mufasa said, Simba, stay where there is light. Because darkness is inherently going to happen when the earth rotates. But you always stay with the light and then leave the hyenas in the darkness. And in the circle of life, there's always going to be darkness because you have to sleep. And when you do sleep, you then have darkness. And then when you wake up, everything that you do that is of significance must happen when there's a light and nothing of significance happens when there's darkness. And therefore, you experience that circle of life, that cycles of the sun, that you're able to make sure that you always do things where there is light. And that's why the circle of life is an important lesson that Simba had to learn from Mufasa. And Mufasa was able to draw the boundary to say, the hyenas, you're going to stay in there and don't ever come that's why when, he, when the Lion King starts, in the first there's a report to say, oh, the hyenas have crossed the boundaries. And what happened? Mufasa went to stop it and he said to Zazu, please take them to their mothers and that I'm going to deal with. What Mufasa was doing there was making sure that there are boundaries that need to be respected that the hyenas cannot go through. And once Simba understands that Mufasa lives in him, he also understands that there are going to be boundaries that need to be followed, number one, between the dark and the light. Secondly, nobody must interfere with the light of Pride Rock. Because how do you bring corruption when you interfere with the right light? That's how corruption then happens. And when there's darkness, there can't be anything that grows in the dark where it's not fed by the light. And so Simba then gets pumped and he goes back to Pride Rock to claim his rightful space. As he goes to Pride Rock, what happens? Voyajek is singing to him. And so you can get this uh, on iTunes, on Apple Music. It's called, called I'll Never Find Another Here and Now, which is a, you know, those piano lessons that Voyo was going through, uh, then they have culminated in this CD. So it's on uh, Amazon CD Baby that says, Simba, you'll never find another here and now, uh, and you need to be able to go claim your pride rock. Do it now and here. Then Simba gets to pride rock, and he confronts Ska, and then he says to Ska, Ska, leave. And then Ska says, <laughs> well, I can't leave yet, Simba, because you know what? We have some small onion skeletons that we're going to deal with. Now, Simbas have secrets that people don't want, that they, they don't want people to know. Because that's how Scars are able to keep their hold on power because they know they're going to spill the secrets. And the best person who used this was Mugabe, Robert Mugabe. He was able to kill a lot of attempts to take over 
by saying, I know your secrets and I can actually reveal them. And so Scar then says to Simba, well, these are the small hyena skeletons that you're going to have to actually deal with before you remove me from power. Yeah. And then he asks a question, but what have I done that warrants my removal from power? I've complied with your wishes as a collective. And that sounds very familiar in South Africa. And then Scar spill the beans and tell Simba's secret to everybody. You killed Mufasa. And now, you know, these secrets that are revealed, Simba was not really ready to actually deal with them. And so he is forced to face the skeleton. So now you can see the mental prowess of a scar in dealing with the lighty because he's manipulating him and he's pushing him and he's using the secrets that Simba has. And Simba can't respond because Scar is able to twist whatever Simba, do you not? Were you not there uh. <laughs> when Mufasa died and says, yes, I was. so you kill Mufasa? Then Simba gets dug into a deeper hole. So as he is facing the skeletons and he's pushed to the edge, and then Scar says to Simba, wow, this looks very familiar. Because now he, think, he thinks, Scar thinks he's won. This was the face of Mufasa before I killed him. And that's where Scar crossed the line. And then Simba protects his light by fighting against being pushed to the edge by Scar. And when Simba protects his light, what happens? The lionesses say, oh, our king is back. We are lit. And therefore, that candle that was lit by Simba was then moving as a flame across to the lionesses. And they go to their rescue of their king because he's now back. Mufasa, with his powers, is back. But he is much more than a Mufasa. And the light is blinding on Scar and is put to the tight spot. And in the tight spot, when the light is too blinding, because now when the lionesses and the Simbas are allowing their light to shine and they don't allow anyone to interfere with their, with their light, what happens to the hyenas? They retreat back to the dark. And then they give Scar a last chance. Say, Scar, leave. You're our uncle. We're not killers. And then what does Scar do? Scar never takes any accountability. And at the end of the day, he then says, I never did it. It was the hyenas that made me do it. And therefore, the hyenas get angry and said, what? And who kills them? The hyenas then kill Scar. And at the end, Scar is not killed by Simba. Simba never attacked Scar because Simba was the uh, Scar was the uncle. Two, Simba never killed Scar. S Simba was not a killer. Karma, karma killed Scar. And then ultimately Simba becomes the king of Pride Rock. And of course South Africa didn't end this way because it's still an ongoing thing. <laughs> and we don't have a Simba yet. <laughs> and uh, so the big question is then, when Simba becomes king of Pride Rock, he takes over Pride Rock. He has Pumba there on his side. He has Timon on his side, but he's controlling. And Nala is there as the captain of the ship. Simba is the kingpin. And then the rest of the people, Zazu plays his advisory role. Rafiq plays his spiritual role. And then ultimately the question is, where are the Simbas in South Africa, in Namibia, in Zambia? In South Africa, 26 years of in freedom. Namibia, 30 years of independence. Where are the symbols of banking? Construction. Property. Black symbols. Mining. That's a big industry. Agriculture. That's a big industry. In South Africa, they aren't. In Namibia, they aren't. 30 years, 26 years, that's quarter of a century. Where are they?
They are there, but they're hiding. So I'm writing a book, and it's a very terrible title. It's called Clever Blacks Are Fucked. I've got 700 pages that I need to cut down because it's a book that never wants to finish. And now we have Black Lives Matter, and there's much more chapters. Yes. <laughs> there's gender-based violence, there's much more chapters. There's homophobia, there's much more chapters. Because clever blacks are truly fucked. Why? So what I say, first, politically, which political party in South Africa is a comfortable fit for the clever blacks? Is it the ANC? Is it the EFF? Is it the DA? Is it IFP, UDM? For the clever blacks, none, none. There's no political party that really represents their interest and there's no political party where they'll feel completely comfortable. So why, why is that? Firstly, because clever blacks are not a political asset. Why? There's no political party that will win elections outright just based on the numbers of the clever blacks. That's why, therefore, they're not a political asset. Mm -hmm. Because what is an asset? We define an asset as a resource that is controlled by the company from a past event which will result in a flow of economic benefits to the company. So if you look at that definition, first, are they a voting resource? No. And are they controlled by politicians? No. no. It's impossible to con control True. clever blacks because there's nothing that you can do to control them. So from a past event, that will result in political votes coming through. So they can be able to give you coalitions. They, they can, they're important, but their deciding factor is that if you don't win the outright majority, the clever blacks can have influence, not power. That's why they're not an asset. And it's not probable that you can actually be able to get that vote. And it's actually not measurable how you can get that vote. That's why they're not a political asset. However, they're an economic asset because if you look at the South African sources of revenue, first one is personal tax. So clever blacks play, pay tax mm -hmm. because of employment equity make sure that they were flooding the different management levels, which means higher salaries. So therefore, their income statement are fluent. So that means they earn high income, but they have high expenses. So that's why from the high income, guess what happens? They are able to then, government is able to get its taxes on personal tax through pay as you earn from the high uh, income levels. Secondly, because they spend a lot, the second source of income is that because they go to restaurants, they go to buy cars, they are buying houses, they are buying all the nice things. So they are the ones that keep the economy going tomorrow. Billionaires will stop being billionaires. When you look at the sources of their wealth, it comes from the things that clever blacks uh, uh, consume. Shop right checkers, <laughs> say, from the things that black people consume. So they are a economic asset but they're not a political asset that's why clever blacks are politically screwed because they don't have the influence and the numbers it's just a numbers game so that's the first area that clever blacks are fucked at secondly clever blacks are screwed when it comes professionally if they work for government professionally that means that they're not going to be able to be promoted to the high levels of government. And you find that in, uh, because of the patronage and deployment policies, uh, whether it's the DA or whether it's the ANC, it doesn't matter who it's deployed. You find that at the top is going to be having people that are not going to appreciate necessarily the level of expertise and the skills that these guys bring because they're going to make it difficult to govern because these guys are nerds. They want you to follow the rules. They will never be able... That's why South Africa will never be able to have 
irregular expenditure if the clever blacks were in power in the, in the organizations, in the government. There's no way because they're saying, no, you can't follow this. This, uh, this is a procurement policy that you need to follow. They will put the policies. They will make sure that they are adhered to because their reputation is on the line. So therefore, by putting people there in the top positions, they don't appreciate that. It helps people to eat. So therefore, Clever Blacks are screwed professionally working for government. They'll never be able to reach the top without compromising their integrity in certain ways. And that is why we're not seeing a lot of greatness coming from the state. And this is not only South Africa, it's across. Then, professionally, if they go decide work for the private sector, they're also screwed. Why? Because there's no clever black that is going to rule any listed entity without having a co-CEO, without having a deputy CEO who has more power. There's no white CEO who leaves. There's no black CEO who takes over a white CEO that has the same powers. I've never seen it. And where it is, there's a change of delegations to say they are now dedicated because it's too much for the clever black to deal with. And if you do find them where they're able to run, then the board might come and have a different case. We've seen Tabo Lodi didn't last. Peter Moyo, old neutral, fight with the board. So you find that they are fucked working in the private sector. Mm that they're never going to run the private sector because it's a world of Pumba and Timon. And then they decide, okay, I'm going to leave and I'm going to start my own thing <laughs> and become an entrepreneur. <laughs> and then they go start their consulting or whatever entrepreneurial business. First, they need to be able to get business from government. Now, for you to get any significant business from government, what needs to happen? Brown envelopes happen, talk. And people say, how are you going to thank me? I can give you this deal. How are you going to thank me? So you have to bribe somebody. And that's what creates the Smolanyana skeletons. Because they were so hungry, they left with this idea that I'm going to be going into my own business. It makes sense to me. And then the reality that they face if they deal with government procurement system is that Hmm, some people might want to get paid. And that's why we have high irregular expenditure. And not a single person has ever been prosecuted and found guilty for creating irregular expenditure. It figures why. <laughs> because people are eating through that. Then, if you do bribe, you create the Smalanyana skeleton, then you create a bottomless pit where they can be able to come and say, we want more, we want more, we want more, until there's nothing left to give. And then what happens? You go back and say, you know what, I'm going to go back to the job market. Mm -hmm. Or you try to go to the private sector. The private sector would say, we have 37 requirements. And you are 30, let's say you're 28 years old. And they say, we want a company that is 30 years old experience in this area. <laughs> So you find that there's so many requirements that black people will never be able to meet because they just started their businesses yesterday. They don't have collateral. They do not have all these pedigrees that can be able to show that this is what I've done. They don't have a track record that is long, that is helped by a having experience with Jedi's company because they had to start things from scratch. And so they get fucked entrepreneurially. And most of them, guess what happens? They fold and then go back to either work for government or work in the private sector. And when they go back and work in the private sector, they're not going to make noises because they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. When they see shitty things happening in government, they're not going to do anything. They'll keep quiet because you know why? Why should you put your livelihood at risk? And can you blame them? Because if they get kicked out, what, 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 who's going to feed their families? 
Who's going to pay for those private, uh, the fees at the private schools? Who's going to pay, uh, maintain those bonds in Centen? Who's going to be able to maintain their Mercedes Benz? Because they have now announced to everybody that I have arrived, and now I have to go back to the township. Hell no. I'd rather keep quiet. I'd rather be a sellout. At least I eat. At least my kids grow. I have shelter. In America, they call them coons. And that's the life we choose to be. That's why clever blacks are fucked. Because they end up having to live with injustices and bullshit in order to be able to just survive. And then when we get back home, then there's black tax. They get punished for being successful. So Vuyo, how can you have a holiday in Durban when your mother's house in Soweto is looking like this? How can you be able to enjoy a holiday in New York when your brother's school fees are still... Yeah. So you have to help all these other people. And these are the people that you're helping and you find that they're not taking any active interest in actually passing. They don't give a damn about whether they survive, I mean, the, whether they pass or not, oh, wow. because you are there. It's for free. Yes, you're the older brother, so you need to be able to take care of this. Then I can mess up and mess up <laughs> and be able to still be fine, because there's no boundary that is being set. And you know there's an internal conflict that the clever blacks feel mm -hmm. to say, I can't throw my family under the bus. Mm -hmm. So they continue suffering the black tax. So essentially, when you look at all areas, black, clever blacks are fucked politically, they are fucked entrepreneurially, and they are fucked professionally. And they are fucked at home. To the point that we ask, how many people can survive if they don't get their month end salary that you know? So most people, like 99%, might not be able to survive because they do not have, they have a whole lot of income coming in, but they're actually living beyond their means. <laughs> So their income statement are fluent, but they're not balance sheet affluent. And then the one percent that can survive, how much, how many months can their balance sheet afford them where they don't have any money coming in? A year is a long time, but there are those. But it's such a small amount that can last for years without anything. But most of the clever blacks don't have a balance sheet that can last them more than two years at most before caving in. And then corona hits, then it just nailed the coffin shut. It really exposed clever blacks. Mm -hmm. And people are losing jobs because of COVID. And then what happens? you find that you are living in a restricted financial scenario. And therefore, are you going to be able to go revolt? Never. Because government will employ you, and therefore, you can't revolt against the government that can potentially employ, employ you. You can't go and speak out in Black Lives Matter against white companies because these are the companies that are going to be able to employ you. Now, if they find out that you are the ones who deface the statue, then you're screwed <laughs> because Facebook, social media has made it all out there. So Cleverplex are really, really screwed. Is that the end of the story? No, it's not. And therefore, how do you get to unfuck yourself? You need to create fuck you money. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you money says, I will not sleep with you. I will not take a bribe and I will not bribe you. You can go fuck yourself, okay? Because you know you have something that, uh, an endowment, 
a balance sheet that nobody can touch, that generates income that will comfortably keep you for the rest of your life. This is what we call fuck you money. So let's say you have a number, 100 million, let's say is a number, and you get 10% return on that. That's 10 million a year. How many people can live on 10 million a year? Lots. You can do quite a lot with 10 million. And that, 10 mil that 100 million, if you invested it wisely and you diversified into different commodities, into different uh, stock and uh, debt, and into different geographies, into different currencies, can be able to increase. And therefore, you are able to know that you can then, you don't have to work for the rest of your life because you have that balance sheet. That balance sheet becomes your fuck you money. And that's what the point is that we're going to get into now, is that this work that we're doing on the reality-based uh, business is giving you skills on how to build that FU money. And it's going to be looking at two things, the technical skills. You need the te technical skills. You know, people that are talented, it's like having a musician who can sing. People Bryson, I did an interview with him uh, once, and I've, got, I've captured it on, on, on video. And he said, you know, I knew how to sing. But what was important for me was I needed to get the technicalities of how to use my voice. Frank Sinatra, watch his documentary. He had an original talent, but with the technical skills that he learned from his vocal coach, he was, be, he was able to churn out all those hits. People Bryson said, even to this day, every single day I do my vocal training, I know how to take off the voice. And you know, and then he encountered a scenario with Celine Dion. Celine Dion is like a mezzo-soprano, and she is like, goes, boo! In 1993, when they had to record Beauty and the Beast, and uh, Celine Dion looked at people, was like, can this guy really hit those notes? <laughs> and then they went into the studio, and then she was at her A game. And then people just said, I'm, 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 doing, I'm giving him a B game and then started, and he was like, boom. Because of that voice training, he was able to sustain it from the 80s to the 90s, even to today, because of the technicalities. It's not about the talent. You need to have the technical skills on how to harness that talent to make things work for you. Aretha Franklin was always also very talented. And she said, my biggest regret is that I never went to Juilliard and learned the theory of music and the techniques of how my music... Technically, her piano playing was brilliant. But can you imagine, therefore, if she had the technical know-how and the theory to elevate it to a different level? Even when her voice starts faltering, she could be able to still continue and be able to sustain the career. So the entrepreneur has to be able to look and say, I can have inherent talent, but that's not enough. You need to be able to have the technical tools. What are those technical tools? How do you actually determine the value proposition of your business? How do you actually identify and segment client? A government client is different from a listed company client. It's list different from a small client. It's different from a multinational. Those are different client segments. There's techniques on how you can segment all those things. You, can, you need to know how do you market to your clients? How do you enable uh, your client to be hooked in terms of their attention so that they're actually able to give you the money? How do you deliver your services? What resources do you have? How do you schedule your activities to deliver the values that you, the clients need, the value proposition for the client? And who are the partners? Because you can't do everything yourself. Who are the partners? And how do you price your stuff? What are the revenue models? All those are technical stuff. That's why business is called a social science, because it's not a pure science. It's a social science because there are techniques that you can be able to utilize to be able to interact from a business perspective. So the first part we cover in the reality-based business is how do you technically 
manage your business. And it's scientific in a sense of it must be predictable when you have the techniques. And then secondly, we then look and say, what are the inner aspects of business? How do you actually manage yourself? Are you at the heart of your business or are you the head of your business? Are you the Simba of your business or the Nala of your business? How do you choose your partner? Most people say, oh no, we got a great idea. I'm going to come and collect partners and we're going to be 50-50. Well, big mistake. On what basis do you choose 50-50? And when the money comes, guess what happens? You fight. And the other one is a taker and the other one is a giver. And sometimes you have people that are selfless givers. Always, they are the ones that lose and the takers always take, take, take because now you have 50-50 and then you end up closing the business. Or it's either you lose out, or you actually close the business. And so what we do in the 15 weeks is that we look at all those inner aspects, the tools, and the politics. How do you determine the inner circle? How do you determine who you need to trust? How do you enable yourself to be able to detect the situation in your clients. Those are inner tools that nobody teaches you, but you can be able to learn them and then learn to apply them because these are the tools that are going to help you build your fuck you money because, and protect your fuck you money. Because at the end of the day, nobody's going to come and help us as black people. You have to help yourself. And therefore, you need to be able to learn the techniques on how you can be able to protect yourself. But not only protect yourself, how you can be able to create value. And when you say creating value, how do you think creatively? You know, I've got an album that is coming out. It came from nowhere. So a song idea just comes. But then how do you take the song idea to its logical conclusion where you're able to list it on iTunes, when you're able to get money. You go and perform and have multiple income streams. In essence, that's what a business is. It's like a work of art where it comes from nothing to something. And there's something that becomes an Amazon. There's something that becomes a Google. There's something that becomes a first friend. All of it, all of it came from nothing, like a song. And guess what? Black people are great at creating songs. Why, why are they not great at creating businesses? Because they don't apply the same principles in creating songs that they can be able to be applying in creating a business. So those are the two things that are quite important. And so we spent 15 weeks to be able to look at what, and it's theoretical. It's a WhatsApp university. You get lectures every day, and every week you get an assignment. And you give us the assignment, and we have psychometric tests. What is the psychometric test testing? First, they're going to test what is your interest, what moves your heart. Because it's important to know yourself. Because not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Some people are good as employees. Some people are good as executives. Some people are good as entrepreneurs to build something from nothing. So you need to be able to understand what am I interested in? What is my passion? But that's not enough. You can be passionate, but it's not going to take you anything. It's not going to take you anywhere. So the second level, how do I think? What is my thinking styles? Because I can be passionate about something, but if I'm able to think about it in a particular way, then I can have a result with that thing. So there's psychometrics that are able, are able to unlock your thinking styles. Then lastly, I can be having the heart for something and I can be good at thinking about it, but do I have the skills? Can I do it? Then the third element is then the skills test. And when you do the skills test, imagine when this is aligned, what I'm passionate about, the way I think about it in terms of understanding the opportunities for this thing, and then having the ability to implement it and do it, then it becomes magical. That's how you're able to deliver a lot of stuff because there is that alignment, it goes back to integrity. 
what I think, what I say, and what I do. And that's going to be inherent in the WhatsApp university. And you're able to do these tests and you get a report along the way that tells you this is what you're good at. And as you then go on the journey, you're able to then have a work plan to say, actually, this is where I want to be, but this is where I'm at. And what is my journey going to be to get there? That's why the 15 weeks are very important to be able to then help solidify that. And at the end, of course, you're going to be then able to have a test that says, am I an entrepreneur? And then I can go ahead and build a reality-based entrepreneurship program. Or am I a person who's got professional competence, who, who's really able to sit on boards, who's able to give value in terms of governance and so forth, then reality-based governance program will be then appropriate. And then lastly, you find people that are still at the early stages of their career, that's when we have reality-based professionals for those people to then say, how do you navigate your way through a corporate to be able to add value up until the point you are able to then be at the top. So there's no cost attached to the reality-based business because it's a WhatsApp uh, university. You're getting every week five lessons a day at 12 o'clock. The lesson gets posted and then you are able to go edit over at your own time. Or you can accumulate the lessons and you're able to uh, do it over the weekend, but you have to have an assignment every single week that is going to force you to do something. And then what you are going to be able to have is these psychometric tests that help you identify your interest, your skills, and your thinking styles. And you are also able to then, at the end, determine which path are you, are you going to be going. And it's for 15 weeks in total. So it's quite intense. And you're also going to be having a two WhatsApp group. One WhatsApp group would be where you get the material. And the material could be a video, could be also the WhatsApp message. But you're also going to have slides. And you're going to have some templates that you can use for your business. So you're able to have some tangible tool to actually utilize what uh, you've learned and apply it to your business or to your company or to your career. And then you're going to have a question and answer uh, that is another WhatsApp group that is a question and answer where everybody can post their questions mm -hmm. and they can be answered there. And then lastly, uh, you're going to be having a uh, weekly check-in session where people are able to ask questions where there's concerns or where there's topics mm -hmm. that need to be dealt with. How do I deal with corona? How do I go and interview a client? Mm -hmm. How do I go and structure a deal? Uh, in South Africa, we'll have a black economic empowerment deal. In Namibia, we'll have a NIEV deal to say, how do we structure those things? So those are the kind of uh, question and answers that will be taking place. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is that we're going to be starting in the first week of August, so the first lecture will be going through on the 3rd of August. And that's when the journey starts. Oh. And what is the whole point of this? Is how do we help clever blacks make fuck you money? Period. Nobody's going to give it to you. Nobody's going to hand it to you. So you need to find a way of then being able to say, this is how I'm going to do it. And how do I reverse me being screwed? <laughs> 